Welcome to Rise from Switzerland, where my university, EHL, has now been in session for one week for our first year students working primarily in the kitchens, from which I'm kept far, far away. I am Professor Damien Hodari of EHL Lausanne. And from lovely London, where this summer week it's going to be hot. My name is Anita Menderata, and I'm excited to be a co-host with Damien on RISE. And I must say, today is a very, very special occasion. Reason being, this is our 10th episode. 10 weeks ago, we all started this journey together as the world started the journey of COVID-19. And it was interesting looking back at this week thinking, how has this journey begun? Technically speaking, on April the 20th, our first show, which was the 111th day of 2020, there were technically speaking 2.2 million cases of COVID-19 around the world. Today, that's up to 8.7 million cases. Sadly, the number of people whose lives were lost was 152,000 at the beginning of this journey. Today, it's up to 461,000. I say that because as we say, every week to get, we get together on RISE to talk about what is this all doing for our industry? Travel, tourism, and hospitality, how is that affecting us? What we saw back in April was that we anticipated worst case scenario, a 30% decline in our industry that was growing on average 5% per year. Today, we're looking at worst case scenario, an 80% decline. So all of this is having a massive effect on all of us going forward, which is why it's so important that as we always say, with RISE, we want to make sure we separate the news from the noise. What do we all need to know so that when our world opens again, we are ready, personally and professionally. With that, Demian, why don't you show us a little bit more about what's happening this show? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm not sure about our audience, but I've probably consumed more news in the past 100 days than in the previous 1,000. And my kids think that I'm reading too much, too much about the virus, too much about the industry, too much about the world and the economy. And maybe it's true, and maybe that's why uh, I'm so concerned about what's going on. But as you said last week in a different discussion that we had on the show, uh, I'm probably more informed now, and so I can make better decisions and understand more about these concerns. And so today we thought we'd bring on two representatives of the media to help us understand a little bit about how they distinguish between the news and the noise and how they make decisions that we all end up um, being impacted by by what we read. So we're looking forward to that. We'll bring them on a little bit later, but as always, we love to begin the show with a question for you. And meanwhile, you're also invited to ask any questions for Anita, myself, or our guests using that Q&A function at the bottom. But let's start, as we always do, with our first poll for you. All right, so webinars in a clear first place, Anita. Uh, I guess we'd be included in there and hopefully uh, were one of the reasons for that. And then if you look a little bit closer, newspapers, magazines, social media, and close second. Uh, our audience watches or listens to less podcasts and watches less television. Um, it might be because our audience skews a little bit towards the younger side. That might be why. Very interesting. I must say, what I find fascinating about this, Damien, is a couple of things. To your point, webinars, because people are using those to fill a lot of time with knowledge and content, but also that all of these actually performed quite interestingly well, which means we're looking at multiple platforms now to understand from multiple directions, verified and unverified, what in the world is going on. Sure. All right, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later with our guests. Brilliant. And that leads us perfectly into our regular segment that we have every week to understand where in the world are we? Because what we're trying to do with RISE is make sure that everyone gets a sense of what do they need to know to be able to look forward. We start with the world, we then look at our industry itself. So where in the world are we? And we've got some headlines for you. This past week has been incredibly interesting because as we've talked about in the past, the pandemic is taking place, but at the same time, there are great concerns about the financial and the mental health of the world. This past week, we had some significant events taking place. Here in the UK, non-essential retail opened up on Monday, and it was fascinating to see the lines that took place of where people wanted to shop and how desperately they wanted to get back out again. 
Many countries around the world were thrilled to see that the rugby match took place down with New, Sil New Zealand rugby on the 15th, with many countries, including my former home of South Africa, thrilled to be able to watch live rugby again, with no limits on the crowds because so many other sports had been taking place, but there were no crowds allowed, no fans on the premises. So I'm sure for the athletes, they were thrilled as well. Spain. This is very interesting. Mallorca last week conducted a trial. 11,000 German tourists were allowed to go back to Mallorca. Looking at it from the point of view of, firstly, how are travelers going to get used to these new protocols when they're in the destination? But also, is there a risk of actually causing another surge of cases because travelers are coming together? This was fascinating and part of a greater experiment that Spain is undertaking that is supported by a 4 billion euro aid package around travel and tourism because ultimately, 16% of that country's GDP and almost 3 million jobs come from tourism. So this is part of the life support of the economy, not just the people itself. IATA launched some very interesting security and intelligence portal tracking devices that ultimately allowed any incidents to be reported anywhere in the world. So if any airline or any airport saw a problem, immediately it was flared to be able to shut that down. July 1st, we also saw major Europeans putting that as their timeline for when Schengen zone tourism is going to open. But as you've spoken in the past, Damien, it's caused a lot of concerns around what are the border controls? What are the curfews? Do you need masks and gloves? And like in the UK, if you come back from a holiday in Spain or Greece, are you going to be quarantined for two weeks? Contact tracing is causing some very interesting concerns, not about the virus, but about private lives and people being in contact with people they might not have supposed to have been in contact with. And ultimately it's, as we say, readying for the next normal. What's going to happen next? Which takes us to our next slide. And that brings us into questions that remain. The fact remains, we are still in a pandemic. Are we going to have a second wave? Do we have issues around social distancing, people getting used to it, and governments allowing that to reduce, like being discussed here in the UK, from two meters to one meter? Are we now looking at best case scenarios or should we be looking at worst case scenarios to really plan ahead as a society, as an economy, and as an industry? And what about sustainability? We get this over and over from our viewers that if people are trying to get the health back of the economy, how much do people really care about the health of cultures, societies, and the environment? Some very interesting, enduring questions. What have you found from your side in the past week? Um, just a couple of things I wanted to bring up. One was different countries and cities are, are talking much more about reimposing restrictions if a local governments aren't enforcing state or national laws, which has been happening more and more, especially in the US. And second, if people are not following the guidelines. So we've seen some restrictions being reimposed in Germany, in Beijing, and um, in Botswana as well, especially because they had only eight new cases, but that was enough for the government to uh, impose some extreme lockdown once again. And unfortunately, even though they were able to play the rugby in New Zealand, New Zealand is no longer virus free. There were two cases brought in by uh, people um, coming to the country from, from the outside. And what was interesting to see was the government's reaction there and saying, this is a failure of our system, rather than trying to make an excuse, admitting that they, they didn't enforce the policies that have been so successful. And hopefully they'll, they'll stick to those a bit more strictly afterwards. How about the industry, Anita? So what's been going on in the industry? And this I found very interesting. And IATA has basically given a sense of what are people searching for? It was interesting to see that in terms of Google searches, less people are looking into what is COVID-19, but more into whatever it is, when am I going to be able to travel again? So there's a bit of a comfort zone being created around the fact that COVID-19 and this pandemic is going to be part of our lives in the medium, short and long term, but people still want to travel. So how can they do so tr safely, knowing that the protocols have been imposed and are going to be vital? I thought this was a very interesting reflection of, as we always say, how comfortable are people feeling in the new normal? 
ultimately, which is a next normal. Because what we're seeing here as well is that a question that came up over and over from viewers with social distancing, with the protocols, with the concerns, are people actually going to want to travel again? And if so, what about the cost? If suddenly there's a seat between you and me on the aircraft, what does that mean in terms of the revenue management and the yields that the airlines are able to get? And this I thought was very interesting, that actually airfares are 23% lower year on year. Now, bearing in mind, this is domestic travel, because we know that many government policies and bilateral agreements are allowing for carriers, especially low-cost carriers, to get back in the skies. Internationals have a long way to go, but it was very good to see that for those who are willing to travel and try out the next normal until we know that we have a vaccine and we can actually manage the process going forward, in the short term, people are looking at getting back on the plane and they're doing it so with the help of lower airfares. I thought this was rather encouraging for those who still want to get out and travel and feel confidence, which is ultimately the currency going forward, is going to be there on their side. And your side, Damien, what did you find? A couple of things. I, I found this really interesting, the, the fact about Berlin nightclub tourism, right? Um, in 2017, there were 3 million tourists that came to Berlin for the primary reason to go to the nightclubs. I, I was astounded by that number. And it generated 1.5 billion euros in revenue from those tourists, you know, with, including their hotels, food, et cetera. Unfortunately, these nightclubs have been shut down uh, 100% this, over the last few months due to the virus. And so I brought this up because we talk so much about hotels or restaurants, airlines, cruises. Let's not forget all the secondary or tertiary industries that depend on tourism and, the, and, and feed into the overall tourism market. And I thought nightclubs is not something we normally think about, but it's cl clearly having a big impact on the market in Berlin and the people who own those establishments, most of which barely break even in a good year. So this year must be extremely difficult. Got a second one, which is some sad news from Hilton that uh, last week laid off 2,100 corporate employees. So we know that we've seen unemployment, for example, in the US at 70% of all hotel employees, but those are primarily at the operational level in the hotels. These are 2,100 corporate jobs that have been slashed from one company. And I bring this up not only because it's another sign that things are tough, but the way these companies are looking at these positions and taking um, three positions and maybe making two jobs out of it, eliminating entire positions. I'll be very curious to see how many of these jobs, not just at Hilton, but at all the firms that are, that are doing this or will be doing this, how many of these jobs are actually going to come back at the corporate level? Or are these firms really going to be making an effort to work um, in a leaner fashion in order to have a better ability to withstand crisis in the future, including a second wave or a third wave? of this current crisis. So we want, we want to watch that going forward. And the third one is from our friends at STR, sister organization of Hotel News Now that um, uh, we'll have a guest on in a little bit. And I, I just really, I've always been fascinated by the extended stay segment, because if you look at the, the left chart for the last 20 years, it has outperformed the overall lodging sector in the US um, consistently over 20 years in terms of occupancy. And then if we look more closely at the chart on the right over the last few months, we see that that continues now, meaning it's a bit more resilient than the other sectors of the industry. And I think there's a couple implications here. One is clearly extended stay is doing well because of the demand for kitchens and more room uh, that people want if they're gonna be locked down. But secondly, because of the resilience, I think we're gonna to start to see more investment going in this direction, like it's been in the States. It's grown at three times the, the pace of the other sectors of the industry in terms of supply. And I think you're going to start to see more of that in other areas of the world as investors start to realize, hey, this is a segment that not only has performed well historically, but is more resilient during times of crisis like now. And that's what everybody's looking for. That's such a great one to show, Damien, because I must say, we always talk about the fact that ultimately consolidation and pivoting are going to be vital in terms of the industry moving forward. And this is a great show of the fact that a traditional smaller model, though faster growth, is now going to impact the traditional model of accommodation. Because as you say, people want to know that particularly when it comes to food and safety and being in a hotel, they have a higher degree of control because they can manage their food and beverage in a traditionally what was known as ultimately do-it-yourself model and, and um, self-contained. So that's a really interesting indicator of the new way in accommodation going forward. Thank you. 
So what we always do every week is make sure that questions that we have from all of you, our viewers, which are really critical to making Rise a success, get answered. So those questions that can't get answered, we carry them over into the next week. And we do it in a 30 second challenge. So Damien, please can you share what's the question that I need to answer from last week? Sure, we've got a question from Shrey. Do you believe that the pandemic could lead the hospitality industry to pioneer a more globalized and informed perspective on social and environmental responsibility? It's a brilliant question. And I'm glad Shrey mentioned this because it's come up a few times. It can and it must. There's no question about it. As Haldane said last week when we had him on talking about the airline sector itself, when does the industry get a chance to reinvent itself? And as our Secretary General of the UNWTO indicates, absolutely, sustainability needs to be part of the DNA of recovery. I do believe as well, as we've said in the past, Travelers are going to be demanding it because we've seen the impact of all of us being grounded and when it's done to communities and environments around us. So absolutely, I'm extremely confident in that. And people are putting their minds to it even before doors, skies and borders open again. How was that? Uh, it was a great answer. I think you went over by a few seconds. I forgot to time you, but I'm going to check later on the recording of this and see how you did. Okay, I promise you I will not forget to time you on this one. So we had a couple of Quivo asking some really important questions about, again, the airline industry. Two viewers want to know how testing will be done in a way that does not cause delays at airports, both in terms of taking the tests and the time needed before the results come before they're boarding. Really good. Yeah. Go. So I, I, we looked into this a little bit. We found that a lot of the international travel organizations are basically saying, to be effective, testing needs to be fast, it needs to be conducted at a large scale, and it needs to be accurate. Um, additionally, it has to be cost effective and it has to not create logistical or economic barriers to travel. So this is probably why most people are saying the testing shouldn't be taking place at the airport. It needs to take place before you get to the airport, ideally within 24 hours before arriving at the airport. And this will also help prevent people who are contagious from coming to the airport and spreading the the virus. Uh, resorts and hotels are saying they can't be responsible for this, nor the arrival destination suddenly having to check people that have gotten there. So I think the key is testing needs to take place before the airport uh, for it to be effective. Great answer, Damien, but I'm afraid your aircraft ended up landing about 40 seconds late. 40 seconds late. <laughs> But great answer and an important one, because as we've said, sustainability and health and safety are going to be the deal breakers of our industry going forward. Okay. But thank you for that. Excellent. All right. Let's take a little bit, a uh, look at some of the headlines that have been in the news the last week that we thought was interesting. I've, uh, I've just got two for us today. The first one is actually a combination of three headlines, basically painting a picture of the New York City hotel industry. And I, I chose the New York one basically because I found the articles on it, but I think it's representative of a lot of places. There are, as travelers are visiting these cities and hotels start to have more occupancy again, that's a positive, but we're starting to see some stumbling blocks in the way the hotels can actually operate. If you look at that first one, New York City hotels battered by pandemic face rift over safety rules. There are disagreements between employees in their unions and the hotel owners and operators about what actually is required to maintain the safety of the employees and of the guests. So everybody agrees they need to wear masks, certain outfits, cleaning products. But what about um, the idea that a lot of the operators and owners have of only cleaning the rooms um, before the guest arrives and after they leave and maybe touching up the room if the guest requires. But the unions are saying, well, this is going to decrease a lot the need for housekeeping staff. And we want to make sure that all these people can get their jobs back. And so in a lot of places like in New York, they're asking that all the rooms be cleaned every day to create those jobs, as well as uh, they, they bring up the point of, housekeepers needing time to change into their outfit, not just housekeepers, but all employees in the hotel. So they're not traveling back and forth uh, through the city using their, their um, uniforms, which will also provide more safety within the hotel. And of course, owners and operators are saying, well, this is going to be too expensive in this era where we're already seeing a lot of financial difficulties. And so they're not necessarily in favor of all those. And I bring this up because there's a lot of issues like this that haven't come up yet that are going to start coming up between the different stakeholders, not only in the hotel industry, but in all sectors of, of the industry. And I think it's particularly important because we're already seeing some hotels saying they're not going to reopen. Uh, most notably, the, the Marriott edition in New York City is saying, we're not going to reopen, we just can't do it financially. 
And finally, the, the, the hotels play such an important role in the social and economic life of cities that we need to be very careful about what we expect hotels to be able to achieve, not just financially, but in terms of providing these important and, and interesting places, not only for travelers, but for locals. And so I just think we're going to see a lot more shifts in the industry as the pandemic maybe settles down. Hopefully, eventually, we're still going to see a lot of repercussions that, that we're not yet even thinking about. All right, a little bit more positive on this one. It's not quite a news article. It was an advertisement from Nordic Choice. Uh, the master franchise for choice hotels in Scandinavia, in the Nordic region. And it's basically, you know, people want more than a hotel room now. They want to be able to move around, they want to be able to move around safely, but they don't want the headaches of necessarily having to go and rent their own RV, find the food, bring their sheets, etc. So choice there is basically saying, you can rent this RV from us, we will fit it out ex exactly the way you want for your trip, we're going to supply food, the linens, the towels, maps, etc. And so it's again, it's one of these pivots that the hotel companies are doing is saying customer needs and demands are changing, even if it's not going to be a huge financial gain for us, it's still something that we can do to demonstrate that we're able to adapt um, and build that flexibility into our organization. So I just thought it was a nice example for, for the hotel industry. I must say it's lovely, Damien, because we never see each other's headlines before we go into every program. And I think if someone were to do some analysis on the last 10 shows and our headlines, but I love the fact that you put this here because when you spoke about Marriott in New York, so much of it about experience delivery as well. And how do especially luxury brands offer that luxury experience when the protocols are at risk of completely snuffing them out because people just have to wear masks and wear gloves. That's a really interesting one as well. So there could be economic reasons, but also just brand protection reasons as well, which this piece is great because it shows that with these individual offerings, the control of risk is in the hands now of the travelers rather than travelers and staff being nervous. I think that's really good. So we'll zip into mine. And mine actually taps a little bit into what we spoke about in the what's going on in the world. I thought this was fascinating and I really wanted to take a look at when the UK opened up its non-essential retail, where did people go and how did they respond? And I thought this was interesting from the point of view of simply exactly what it says, that ultimately when people are so excited to get back out again, that they forget the social distancing issues and the need for it. We've said since the beginning, this is an invisible crisis, which allows people to get comfortable in the discomfort zone. And what I thought was fascinating was when I was watching the news itself and they asked someone, why did you line up for four hours to be able to go into, interestingly, Primark? And the argument was, I just wanted to feel normal again. So part of it actually isn't about going out and spending money. It's just being able to go back to what routines we had, even if there is no going back, it's now a next normal with the masks and the gloves, but the credit card also in hand. This takes me to my second one, which I must say, this scared me terribly when I saw this. It happened on Wednesday, which was a special day for me, but it eclipsed it very rapidly. Because when I saw how quickly this case coming up in a market in Beijing immediately caused 27 neighborhoods to be shut down, 1,200 flights. What scared me was, I thought it was fantastic, the speed with which, with which the market was shut down and mobility was shut down. Mm -hmm. However, there are questions. Was it animal to person? Was it person to person? Because the markets are so crowded and people are shoulder to shoulder, which means by implication, what is the mutation of this virus? The current hypothesis is that the virus actually came from Europe. So now we've got this virus that's traveling around the world, getting more robust. What does that mean in terms of second waves? Because second waves translates into worst case scenarios for societies, for economies. This scared me enormously, but it did give me some peace of mind and feeling at least people are taking it very seriously, very quickly. So that was great. But that then leads as a bit of an entry into what our guest segment is about in saying for all of the media that we've been watching, all of the news, it has been critical. It's been a life support system because people have been disconnected from the world. So we've been turning to the media, formal and informal, to understand what in the world is going on. But we've also found, and even the media is stating, that we need to be really careful because our mental health is linked directly to the challenge of facing this physical health challenge. So many media outlets have decided that they're going to be not just about getting information out, but helping with well-being. 
And I thought this was really beautiful. It's one in a series that was created by CNN and it explains what, exactly what it is. And it's clear why we need this every single day. Please. I must admit, every time I see these pieces come up when I'm watching CNN, I'll be working in my flat and just the slowness of the music makes me look up and it's calming. But I also love about the fact that these little clips are taking people around the world because even though we're all grounded, travel has become a huge source of inspiration for all of our lives. So we're able to still keep traveling even though we're grounded for the next X number of days. And this then takes us perfectly into poll number two before we go into our guest segment. Damien, over to you. I guess let's just open up that poll and see what people have to say. Hmm. Huh. More on the concern side. Um, very few saying they're more confident from what they're reading. So I think this goes a little bit to what I said uh, with the introduction to this segment, right? The reading more, making me more concerned, but yet making me more informed. And, and hopefully that's what the, the media is all about, is trying to make us more informed and not necessarily, you know, swaying us in one direction or the other, which would be more, I guess, the noise. Absolutely. All right, let's get our guests on. Um, and I'm going to let you, Anita, introduce them both, please. Excellent. I'm very excited to introduce this segment. We're going to be talking to the leaders and hearing what they're saying about news versus noise. Now, interestingly, we've got ultimately a review of the spectrum of media because media has become a very generic term, especially with social media and all of us with our mobile devices now being the media. But media has a model. And it's important that we understand that. And that's why with RISE, we try to have guests on that help us understand that. So we have the two sides of the spectrum. From the editorial side, we have Stephanie Rica, who's the editorial director of Hospitality News Now, a highly, highly respected and regarded specific industry network and platform that allows us to get a sense of what's going on in our industry and should we be more concerned or more confident. On the other side of the spectrum, we have James Hunt, the VP of Creative and Marketing at CNN International Commercial. So he's not on the editorial side, he's on the commercial side. And there's a difference which we'll explore going forward. So welcome to you both. And I'll hand it back to Damien to do the first question to you. Yeah, as always, we'd love to hear what our, our guests have to say about the results of that, of that second poll. So as you saw, it seems that people are more concerned uh, from what the news is reporting rather than feeling more confident. Does that resonate with you? Uh, maybe we can start with you, Stephanie. Yes, and thank you, Anita and Damien, for having me here. And I was really interested to see what viewers would say in response to that poll. And I would say that from my perspective as a traveler, I agree. From my perspective as an insider, that I'm more concerned. From my perspective as an insider, knowing a little bit more about the travel industry, it's funny because I get a lot of, you know, my friends and family who are asking me, well, when do you think we'll be able to travel? Because it looks like the news is so bad and we're really concerned about it. And I will break it down with them and say, okay, you know, maybe if you drive, you control the process a little bit more and you can feel confident about hotels for X, Y, Z reason or about destinations. And, you know, you really have to break it down. So I think that was a really emblematic poll and response of how I think the the world is feeling versus maybe um if you dig down into it it can be a little bit more clear and more confidence building yeah okay and james how, how, how's your view on that question uh well again uh hello everybody thank you for having me um yeah i i'm not hugely surprised as well to be honest i think we're still you know in the early stages i think as you guys have been talking about about coming out of the crisis so i think you know there's obviously been an awful lot written and said over the last few months about the sort of stages that we're gonna go through. And, and interestingly, we've done quite a lot of research into that as well. So I think there is still anxiety out there. There's a lot of information to process as well, but I think 
the hope is, is that, you know, as we continue to, over the next few months, that people will start to feel more and more confident about, you know, going out and about more. Yeah. Brilliant. I have a question for you both. Um, and starting with yourself, James, when, we, we, when I introduced you both, I spoke about the spectrum between editorial and commercial. And it's yeah. often referred to as church and state. What is that all about? And why is that important when it comes to media, especially in today's day and age of social media? Sure. So I, I work on the commercial side um, of the network and we effectively provide um, financial support for the news gathering editorial teams around the world to do the work that, that we see and hear every day. Um, and we do that broadly in three different ways. Um, people buy CNN from a subscription basis. We sell content. So we sell the news gathering and the, and the content that we make all around the world to other news and publishing partners. Um, and then the sort of specific area that I'm most involved with is we work with advertising partners all around the world um, and helping craft and develop their own messages using our platforms. And how does that differ from the editorial side in terms of the, again, the line between churches? Yeah, so we will obviously work closely with, the, with our editorial colleagues, but the content that we create is obviously very clearly labeled commercial content, advertising content, um, and, and my team, um, particularly on the brand studio side of things, has nothing to do with editorial content, which is the, you know, the principles um, source of news that everybody comes to us for. And, and those two teams, whilst they work collaboratively together, they are very, very clearly separate. So we are just on the, on the commercial side. Brilliant. And Stephanie, from your point of view as well, how, does, how do you interpret the line between church and state from a trade publication perspective? Well, and that phrase I've always um, laughed at because in, in my years as a journalist, I've always wondered who's the church and who's the state. <laughs> but, um, you know, for trade publications, so Hotel News Now is primarily a business to business publication, um, also called trade publishing, where our audience is very built in to our industry compared to a more consumer facing publication like CNN, where CNN is going after so many different facets of an audience based on their content. So we have more of a niched audience of people who are there because it's their business. So for that reason, I think that separation is a little bit easier to handle. We, so I manage the editorial side of Hotel News Now, which is very, um, very news driven and it's very hands off from our business partners. So our business side of course is doing, like James mentioned, selling advertising, selling, you know, various related products that fit with our editorial model. But um, we're very lucky at Hotel News now that, um, you know, we're part of the STR family where we get a lot of support and we're allowed to and encouraged to pursue the news in a very pure form. Um, that's not the case for all trade publications. It's not the case for all publications, you know, everywhere, but we're very lucky that we are supported in doing that. Hmm. I've got a slightly different question for both of you. I'll start with Stephanie Nass. I'm so curious, and I mentioned that I've been reading a lot and probably too much. I'm curious if, if you guys are seeing an increase in people clicking on the articles and reading the articles that you guys are publishing during this crisis, or are they tuning out more now? And if they, and second part of that question would be, what, what do they seem to be most interested in reading about? Mm -hmm. And we noticed that very much. And in the beginning, really, we weren't sure what to expect because we have a good daily reader engagement. We're sending news, new news content out every day. So we have good daily engagement. But we started um, around the end of March, really looking a lot closer at our viewership statistics week over week. So typically we would look at them month over month. And then anecdotally, we sort of see what's happening day by day. But we set up a whole new series of, you know, key performance indicators to look at week over week. And we've noticed since we started tracking that we are still going up. So in general, it's average views on all content, as well as total visits to our site week over week have generally risen between four and 7% since the end of March currently. Okay. So is that a signal that people are really are concerned of what's going on and feel this need to stay abreast even more than before at what's yes. happening. Mm -hmm. I think so. And they're going for all different types of content. You know, we can usually tell what things will perform well for us. And it's kind of funny, you know, we launched 
early on, we launched um, a segment called Highlights, where we wanted to bring together some very positive news, some good news every week. That segment does not get as many views as we anticipated that it might. We thought, oh, you know, people have fatigue over the bad news and they want a little bit of good news, but it's, it's more the realistic approach. You know, they just want to know what's happening. And James, I guess a similar question would be on, on the advertising side of CNN. Is there a shift? If we talk about tourism, hospitality, are you seeing some industries or types of firms that would normally want to advertise just not being able to do it now and not yeah. appropriate? I mean, just uh, firstly, on the, I mean, on, the, on your first question, actually, I would say, you know, we've, we've seen enormous engagement across our platforms. I would say all major internationally renowned news organizations have seen huge increase in in traffic i think that's you know we, we did a piece of research right at the start with one of our research partners and you know in times of crisis people go to uh, trusted news sources and organizations to find out information so you know we i mean just to give you one statistic we had our largest month ever in march for cnn in 40 years so almost 260 million people Unique visited, visited the website in March as people were clamoring for that information. Inevitably, that's tailed off a little bit, but we've still seen unprecedented traffic for the last three or four months. Okay. On the other side, I would say, yeah, I mean, we, you know, something very close to both of your hearts, I know, and, and um, you know, the rest of the guys that are on the panel and stuff, travel and tourism is clearly a sector that has been paused over the last two or three months with, you know, destinations businesses related to the travel and tourism sector that have quite naturally paused and, and wanted to wait and see and things how go, uh, you know things how are going to develop but on the other side we've seen sectors like home entertainment biz tech e-commerce insurance those sorts of brands actually have have been more engaged taking you know taking advantage of probably new habits being formed and um, and new opportunities for people. I mean, when we were in lockdown, for example, again, similar research that we've done, no surprise to know that everyone is streaming far more content. People are watching more stuff mm. because they were obviously, everyone was in their homes and indoors and so on. So we've seen different advertising sectors pick up at different rates over the last four months, just based upon what everybody has been experiencing. Mm. James, I have a question on that because the, as you said, category by category, it's, it's, it's evolved during this time. And yet, about three weeks ago, I was very excited that Damien and I were able to preview to our, our global viewers, because we've got about 50 countries watching, the, the new CNN campaign, The Travel yeah. Tomorrow, which was really special in the work that you did with the UNWTO. And we found that the travel industry, it's, it's, it's still a huge future desire, both in terms of travelers and travel professionals. Yeah. How have you been able to meet the needs of countries, destinations, who still want to stay connected to travelers, but know that telling them to travel right now is, is just not the right thing to do? And, and concern is valid. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah, well, thanks for bringing it up, Anita. I mean, I think first of all, we were, you know, really delighted to do the campaign with UNWTO because we felt at the time that it was the right message. It was a responsible message to put out um, to, you know, we can all dream, you know, that I'm sure that one of the things that we've all had the opportunity to do over the last few months is to dream about that next holiday, that next destination. And, you know, to your point about the 30 seconds of calm, you need a little bit of escapism. You need to be able to, um, to think about what's coming next. But I think, we also recognized, you know, two things. One, I think is, you know, the UNWTO quite rightly with us, we wanted to put out a message of responsibility, staying at home, reinforcing that message, supporting the kind of public service and, and medical announcements that we've also been supporting as part of the last three months. Um, but at the same time, I think we also wanted to acknowledge our partnership with the industry and with all of those destinations that we work with, that we were thinking about them um, we've obviously had a lot of dialogue behind the scenes is, and I know you've been involved with a lot of that. There's been a lot of dialogue with our partners about when is the time right to start to coming back? When are we going to change that messaging in line with, you know, with government communication as well? So, you know, we were, we felt it was important to do that. Travel and tourism is a really important part of what we do um, and a very important sector to us and close to many of our hearts. So yeah, it was, it was great to be able to acknowledge that in hopefully a way that, 
gave people inspiration for traveling tomorrow, which is what the, you know, the campaign was, was designed to try and do. Right. Stunning. Debbie, should we shift to the audience questions? I'd like to do that. Excellent. Right, do we have some questions for our guests? Yes, we do. Um, I have a question from Gary asking, what do you think the most important story is today about travel in the future? Interesting. Uh, Stephanie, want to start with that one? I think the most important story, and again, my perspective is more internal to the industry. The biggest issue coming up is labor and what's going to happen with um, hotel workforces coming back. So we see those, you know, those early indicators that travel in the summer, especially drive to travel is returning. Hotels are reopening, especially in tourist destinations. It's going to be leisure travel driving it. That's all great news and you see very small incremental rehiring of people, but this was a huge uh, issue for the global industry pre-pandemic. I think it's only going to be tougher coming back. Some of those stats that you mentioned earlier in the program about rehiring people and, and automation and, and union involvement as well, particularly here in the States, it's a huge issue and we've only just started to see what the problems will be. I agree completely. And James? Change, I would say. I think, you know, I just think everything is going to be different. And I think people have to, um, you know, recognize that, you know, to pick up on, on, you know, on Stephanie's point, it's not just going to be the how hotels are going to be staffed and managed and run. It's, it's the experience at the airport. Are we going to be able to do our shopping in the same way? Queuing in, at, at customs is going to be a different experience. Everything, I think, is going to be different. Um, and I think uh, that combined with that sort of probably that first time that you do go on a journey and you experience that change, I think is, is the other big thing. I think it's going to take time for us all to get used to it. And I think, um, you know, businesses and the supply chain and how we experience tourism, travel and hospitality, which is a, another big part of that, I think is, is, is important for us to recognize that things are going to be different um, and different for a while. Thank you. Sarah, we got another question? Yes, we do. Um, Nicholas asks if you've observed or experienced any form of paradigm shift in the advertising sector. James, has there been a big shift? Yeah, so, I mean, again, I would say there, have def there are definitely sectors that have been, I'd say, hurt more than others in this, you know, in, in the last three or four months. I mean, we've seen, we've had a lot of dialogue with our clients, but I think, you know, when we talk about brands and the roles that brands have played over the last three or four months, I think there's a couple of interesting things I would pull out. First of all, I think a lot of brands quite naturally sort of pressed pause immediately on their activity because A, they may have had a, a particular message that they were planning to push out in a marketing or advertising campaign that just wouldn't necessarily have been relevant anymore. And so I think naturally brands had to take a breath and decide, well, what is, our, what is the most relevant message now that we need to give to our consumers? Um, so I think that's important to note. And I think the other thing is, then it's, then it's saying, well, what do our consumers want to hear from us at this particular time? And I think getting that message right is something that we've spent a lot of time working with our advertising partners, you know, being responsible, making sure that you're authentic in what you're saying, making sure that more than ever you're adding value to those customers and consumers. Um, and the research again that we've done has actually shown that overwhelmingly people want to hear from brands, but they want to hear from them in the right way with the right message um, delivered with the right context, given everything that we're going through. So I think there have been hits and misses that we've probably all experienced over the last three months, but we've certainly seen, as I said, that there's been a, a greater increase in dialogue about brands wanting to make sure that when they do come back, their message is absolutely right for that audience and that they're not, you know, missing the mark as it comes to public perception and so on. Okay. Maybe we can get another question, Sarah. Yes. I have a question from Shrey. I think you've covered a bit of it, but there's a second question to this entire question. So Shrey asks, do you believe the aspect of immediacy for information is driving the degree of concern for the masses? If so, is pacing 
the communication of information an option in an interconnected world? Stephanie, you want to maybe take that, especially the second part? That's a great question. I think um, absolutely the pace of information that's being disseminated is is nonstop. It's 24-7. And we said, too, at the beginning, you know, my newsroom was like, you know, we're a daily news outlet. We're used to daily deadlines and daily everything. But now we've become 24-7 like CNN. And so for each outlet, for each news source, you see that that velocity pick up. And as far as that question about whether it's something that we consider, consider that pacing and, and changing and moving, it's tough to, you know, you can't really put the toothpaste back in the tube. Yeah. We are all 24 seven. And I think that's about to become even more frequent to 24 seven, you know, one hour by hour, minute by minute. We have time for another question, Anita? Uh, we do indeed. Great, Sarah? Yes. Um, I have a question here from Jennifer. While you need to report on now, how do you keep hope and excitement about the future? Right. Is that, and I would just add to that, is that your responsibility to keep people motivated for the future? Or are you really just here to report the news? Maybe we can get both of you with real quick answers. James, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think first and foremost, you know, we, our responsibility is to try and as accurate as we possibly can report what's happening around the world. You know, it's, it's been tough, you know, there's, there have been some brilliant stories that I think have been reported during this during this crisis over the last three or four months. But it, you know, we have to acknowledge that we're in unprecedented times and that there's been unfortunately a lot of very sad news, um, you know, that's just gone on. I mean, Anita, you know, just gave everybody a sense check as to the losses of life that we've seen around the world. It's it's tragic, I think. But as I said, I think that there have been pockets of inspiration, and we've certainly covered those as well. But it's you know let's be honest, the overriding global story of our time in the last five months, and I don't think we're going to we'd see the end of it anytime soon, is COVID-19. And I think that un unfortunately, that is a story that's laced with, you know, with, with sadness and, um, you know, around the world. So, you know, we, as I said, inspiration where we can, um, and there certainly is that, but it's, you know, we, we try and report what's there at the moment in front of us. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, just a, a real quick, do you find it also difficult to be reporting facts and what's going on and yet still keep the industry um, moving forward and people optimistic about it or is, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Well, it's tough and it's a balance and I agree entirely with what James said about how we have to strike that balance. And I think for us, it's been, you know, we, we have to report the news as it's happening, but I think that you can find hope and optimism through very well reported news that is showing a lot of different angles and finding different stories and it absolutely is our responsibility as journalists to find those different stories and include those different angles because i think where you get bogged down is when your news is coming from you know one point of view that is not open to showing the whole picture and anytime you can show the whole picture as much as possible there absolutely will be rays of optimism okay you know, it's interesting if I can just jump in on that, because it's something that Damien and I do every week with the whole what in the world's going on. It's content versus context, because I think this is where, to me, the hope and opt optimism comes from putting things in context. The numbers might be X, but they mean Y. And, and I mean, I've, I've made it very clear on past programs as well that I have a longstanding relationship with CNNI. I love what you do with Sesame Street and the whole ABCs of COVID-19 to help little people understand it. And it's actually not the little people, it's the parents being able to articulate it to a child who's seeing their parents scared and home every day. Yeah. I think that's glorious. So there, there's, in, in whether it's COVID-19 or life in general, there's always bad news out there, but it's the context that it allows us to keep looking forward. Yeah, think about, I mean, if we want to, I mean, globally, I would say this is the case. I mean, you know, think about the the stories of heroics and heroism that we've seen around the world from our, you know, health officials around the world. And, you know, we've come to understand 
this worm key worker and who is key work, who, who are key workers in keeping society moving and so on. And, you know, if, if particularly in the UK, you know, we're very proud of our NHS, as you know, Anita, and I think there's been some incredible stories that have been covered in many, many countries around the world about what health officials and people on the front line that have done um, to, to battle this, you know, this pandemic. And, and, and those are really inspirational and uplifting. And I think if we can reset that a little bit as well and come out of this and recognize that, you know, our doctors and nurses and, and cleaners and porters and people who run our hospitals and our health centers and medical centers around the world, if they can be held up as heroes, then that maybe is a, is a positive story to come out of, of, of this. Which leads us perfectly into our wrap as we close up, because as we shared with you both in the briefings, Rise was a name and a brand created at the beginning of this journey back in 10 episodes ago, and it's become an acronym. And I'd love to hear from you both based on what you've now seen and experienced about Rise and knowing our industry incredibly well. Stephanie, how would you turn Rise into an acronym? Well, and I admit, I thank you for giving us the heads up on this so that I could work on it. But I'll tell you what I came up with before is different from what I'm coming up with now because I, I jotted down some words that came up throughout today. And so my acronym is resilience, innovation, safety, and enthusiasm. Huh. James, top that. Uh, well, mine, I've, I'm afraid I've, I've kind of taken inspiration from um, us being a, you know, a news organization and also with me, me sort of leaning to working with our advertising partners. And I've gone with reliable insight equals strong engagement. Huh. Ah. I like that. I might steal that too, James. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you both. I'll leave it to Demi and to close. Yes. I mean, uh, unfortunately, we don't have more time, but we, we really appreciated this. This is such a different angle for us to have media here. And I thought it was really, I mean, I learned quite a bit. So I appreciate that. And hopefully our audience did as well. Thanks for continuing to report the noise, the news. <laughs> I knew I would make that mistake. <laughs> really appreciate it. And hopefully in a few months, we can get you back on as things have evolved and maybe see how, how things have changed in your industry. So thank Pleasure. you very much. Thank you. For Thanks both time. much. Thank you for yeah. having us. Thank yeah. you. Very good stuff. The good stuff. I like your little slip there. <laughs> it happens sometimes. It happens when I don't have a script. That's what happens. I know we're pressed for time, so let's uh, let's move forward. Uh, Perfect. I think it's concerns and confidence. Indeed, indeed. As we always say every week, I ask the grout, "What are you concerned about?" And I see if I can put my rose-colored glasses on and find the confidence behind it, sir. Look, I think. Um, it's a little bit what I said in the beginning with the with the news piece about the unions and all the repercussions that are going to be arising from the, the pandemic. So we're just touching the surface now. We looked last week a little bit at some of the issues as well, lawsuits that are going on. Now we've got union problems. And I think my concern is this, is that we don't know all the implications of this, not just health-wise, but what does it mean for labor? What does it mean for financial institutions? What does it mean for owners, for operators, for the tour guides, for everybody in the supply chain? And so we know what's happening now and how people are dealing with it, but the implications six months from now, a year from now, you know, I'm already pessimistic about the future, about the six months, 12 months. So that, that's my concern. Your concern's a thousand percent valid, and it goes back to what Stephanie said about labor being a huge issue going forward. We're losing one million people a day, and that's where it's, it's a very valid concern. Because we've got a long way to go, and um, I, I'm confident we'll get through it. It just frightens me how long the next normal and then the next normal and then the next normal will be. And I, and I think related to it is the fact that nobody knows, right? So we don't know, the governments don't know, the companies don't know. We're all working through this, you know, in, in real time. And I think it's a challenge. And I think uh, it's gonna be a lot of learning from this and hopefully, you know, we'll be better prepared for the next crisis. And hopefully this crisis will get better managed as we go forward. Stunning. Looks like we have one last question. Oh, good, Sarah. Yes. We have a question from Daniel. Do you see budget hotels and low cost airlines taking longer time to recover? I think it's the opposite. I think what we've been seeing so far is the lower end hotels are outperforming the higher end hotels. This is because people are concerned about money. They're generally more near the highway. They're generally more about driving distances. We don't need international travel to, to go to those. So on the, on the hotel side, I absolutely think it's uh, it's the opposite. I don't know airlines, Anita. 
Similarly, I think it, uh, because so much of it is regional travel, it's the low cost budget airlines. So they're going to be on the front line. Absolutely. Yeah. Stunning. As we wind into the last session, as we always say every week, we want to hear your story and get a sense of how have you used these 100, 150 days and how are you making sense of your next normal in our industry? And so we ask you, please do send us an email at riseweekly2020 at gmail.com. We'll tell you what to do in terms of putting your little video together. And we have Scott as this week's example. Hi, everyone. I'm Scott. I'm Singaporean. And I just graduated from EHL. Recently, I moved to Dubai to join the Kempinski Regional Office. And this move has proven to be more challenging because of the COVID situation. Um, when I moved here, I was asked to go into quarantine for eight weeks. And during that eight weeks, I decided to work out a bit more, read up on the documents that my, um, my company has at the same time, really gaining that knowledge. And um, with that, it really made me stay motivated because I knew that once I get back into the office, I had to um, do more and I had to really try to impress my bosses too and this was one of the reasons why I kept being active and I knew that I needed to be better when I get to the office so yeah that's my story I hope you enjoyed it thank you I really like the fact that he recognized that he had to take advantage of that time to improve himself learn more so that he could deliver even more afterwards partly so that they would keep him on and second this is what we've been telling people who are out of a job right now. You've got to find a way to add additional value. You have to go beyond what you were going to do before this because there's just not going to be the jobs, nor at the corporate level, like we saw with the Hilton example, nor at operational. So I, I appreciate that very much. Great example of digging deep. What's up next week, Damien? So next week, we're looking at the future of online booking, uh, right? This is a critical part of the whole value chain. We know that the Expedia's and Booking.com's of the world have had a, a frenemy relationship with a lot of the organizations, uh, hotels, airlines, etc., that they sell um, on their behalf. <clears throat> and we're going to see some fundamental changes, I think, in this industry going forward. And so we've got a, a true expert with us next week to help us understand how this is going to evolve. Stunning. So as we wrap up, as Demian and I always say, please keep in contact. Our website is there for any past episodes you want to say. And from both of us, a sincere thanks for being with us for these 10 episodes. We started this journey with no end point. And as long as the industry needs us to keep doing this, we're going to keep doing it for another 50, 60 episodes. What do you think, Demian? With maybe a little break in between. Indeed. So until then, to our Wizards of Oz behind the stage, Jessica, Grace, Katia, and Sarah, thank you as always for doing such a brilliant job itself. To everyone watching, we look forward to seeing you next week. If you want to stay on for some extra questions, we will hang on. But until next week, stay safe, stay strong, stay home, stay hopeful, and keep your hands clean. We'll see you next Monday. Bye, everybody.